Hey y'all, so today we've got lots and lots of planting to do, and we're going to start off with uh, transplanting the turquoise uh, meal corn that I started inside. I will also be seeding in um, direct sowing the same kind of corn uh, in the same bed. So I'm using a square foot planting method. It's the same method I used last year for my sweet corn, and in each square foot, um, I will be putting one of my transplants and one um, seed. I did try taking off um, the bag off of one of my transplants here, but the roots um, got torn off instead of pulling through. So I just went ahead and planted the um, transplants with the whole bag intact. Um, I'll just have to take, pull those out at the end of the year and remove them. They don't really break down. And with these ones, uh, as you can see, the roots actually grow through quite easily, so I'm not worried about the roots being restricted by the bag. I know some, some of the different kinds of netting and stuff that you have on different ones um, can, can be rather restrictive, so I'm, I'm glad to see that these guys definitely aren't being held back. Another option would be to potentially just uh, cut some holes in the sides and or bottom of the bag just so that if the roots do get bound up, they have a way to escape. It's a little bit of a bigger opening. I'm just going to go ahead and plant these a little bit deeper um, than the pods themselves. So I'm probably going at least a half inch deeper than the plugs here. And I'm just trying to make sure that the roots of these... Um, corn plants are going to be nice and deep uh, for two reasons. One is that the moisture in these beds um, is going to be a little bit lower down. The uh, surfaces tend to dry out fairly fairly well in the raised beds, so getting a little bit deeper means that they'll be a nice uh, moist material. The other reason is obviously for wind. Um, and by the time you see these guys next, it's going to be, they're, they're, they will have shown that the wind has already hurt them a bit. Um, this was filmed on Saturday. Uh, couldn't get it out ahead of time, so I'm just putting it out as soon as I can. I've just been burning out, um, burning out a bit, planting everything out as much as possible in the time that I've had over the last couple of days here, so... But yeah, basically, um, you want to get the roots nice and deep. If you plant corn and or seed corn too uh, shallowly, the roots tend to be just below the surface, and a good wind will just knock them right over, um, especially earlier on. So I'm just trying to get them nice and deep. And with the seeds as well, I wasn't super careful with these seeds, but when I did do my sweet corn, I made sure that they were for sure at least an inch and a half um, down into the ground. So that's fairly deep as far as seeds are concerned. With these raised beds as well, um, the fact that they're raised up makes them a little bit more um, susceptible to wind. And also the soil is less compacted and therefore it is easier for plants to get pulled out of it. So with the square foot planting method, I'm basically putting a transplant in one corner of the square foot and a seed in the opposite corner of the same. And so there will be two plants in each spot. And this way, if my transplants don't recover well, then I still have a chance with the direct seed. And if the direct seed doesn't have enough time, then hopefully the transplants will have had enough time. This way, um, all my eggs aren't in one basket, so to speak. So we're just going to go ahead and finish that um, and I'm just going to remind you that you need to water your transplants um, and my uh, motto is soak it, stir it, soak it again. This applies to transplants and uh, also campfires. So when you think you've put enough water in, wait a minute let it all soak in, and then water it again. Um, transplants that are used to a certain type of soil can have a pretty harsh reaction when they're introduced to sandier soil, in my case, um, and warmer soil as well. 
So make sure they have a good amount of water, especially right at the beginning. Um, just to make sure that they're not going to immediately um, suffer. So the temperature has finally warmed up enough that we can basically plant everything. So that's what's going to be going on in this video. I'm not going to show absolutely everything that I've put in the garden. Um, it, partly because I don't have the time to film all of that. And partly because a lot of that is going to be determined by what you, you know, I, I can't tell you how to do everything because there's so many variables that are going to be different for you. So you need to be checking your own soil temperature. You need to be looking at your own plants and your own weather forecast and stuff to figure out when it works for you. So I'm just going to show you some of the sort of method aspects of um, how I plant stuff and, and try and help uh, give you the information so you can decide for your situation how you need to uh, go about doing things. So I'm going to be planting my tomatoes in here. Um, as you can see on the flat side of the right hand side of the screen here, that is the uh, carrots, multicolored carrots that we've sown. And um, so I'm trying not to pile the dirt onto them. Um, and at the same time, dig a dig deep enough hole for these uh, tomatoes. So I'd like to make a nice deep hole. And then I like to angle up the uh, back side of the hole, the side farthest away from me. Um, and then I put my tomato plants in, actually lay them down at an angle. There'll be a better shot of this in a minute. But um, basically I lay that down in there sideways and then I use the angle that I cut off the back of that um, hole. And I just fill it in a little bit and um, put my stem up against that so that it's not um, coming at a 90 degree angle um, at any point that it can sort of bend gently upwards. You can plant them super, super deep, but uh, I tend to not want to dig that deep into the soil. It's going to be a lot cooler that far down, and it's uh, really hard to um, dig that deep, honestly. So I kind of just dig as deep as I can, make a nice little trench, put a gap in the back. I always put a little bit of dirt in, and then I add... Um, a little bit of water, and that just helps settle the dirt in around the um, little plug of soil from the pot. Uh, that just prevents any big gaps of air because the roots will not grow in big air gaps. So I like to water right into the root ball, and then I'm adding a little bit of a granular feed on top, making a bit of a moat or a trench or a well around the base of the tomato that I can water into. This will just help that uh, when I pour water in there, it'll actually stay right next to the plant and sink down instead of just running off uh, sideways, especially as these raised beds are a little bit domed. So whenever you're working with a bit of a slope or you want to water a very specific plant and not the entire area, um, I just like to put a little, a little moat around my plant. And here I am just uh, very painfully, according to the camera, um, attempting to trap my soaker hose in over that well so that the soaker hose will actually help to fill that well. And i um, just going to push that uh, in and stick the tomato in through there. Now you can see these guys have been laying down for quite a while. And so they're a little bit um, floppy. Uh, that's not going to be the end of the world. I'm not super worried about it if my plants are looking a little bit stressed before they get planted out. It's kind of normal. Um, they will recover. I just make sure they get plenty of water and I actually came in later um, off camera to tie these up with string and I'll show you that method later on just because they were looking a little bit floppy and I didn't want the wind to snap them off where they were bent. So I'm just going to go ahead and repeat that with the second tomato here. Um, Generally, if you're planting in good soil and you know that you have good soil, I do recommend taking, um, doing a soil test either at home or um, you can contact your local egg center maybe. Um, you'll just have to look up for whatever your, your area is. Um, I did a soil test a little while ago. I know that my um, manure on the surface is 
fairly good, but still a little bit lacking in nitrogen. And I know that the soil underneath is very poor. It is basically just sand with a little bit of clay in it. Uh, has very, very low nitrogen, um, almost nothing. And uh, fairly low levels also of both um, potassium and phosphorus. And so that's why I put in a little bit of a granular feed for my tomatoes. Um, I'll generally just do that once in a year, right in the spring. And if I see blossom end rot developing a little bit later on in the tomatoes, then I'll go ahead and add some more, or I'll do a little bit of a soluble fertilizer right then, sort of as an emergency, um, and then do a granular feed. But unless I see problems, I don't generally fertilize. Fertilizer is not an automatic, you have to, um, you should generally only be fertilizing if you know that there's a deficiency because you've tested or because you see that your plants are struggling um, with a deficiency and you've diagnosed that. Um, at which point you should pick a fertilizer that has the kinds of nutrients in it that you need. And uh, yeah, so blossom end rot is caused by a lack of calcium in your plants. Um, the solution to this is not always adding calcium to your soil. If like my soil, your soil has almost no nitrogen in it, then um, adding calcium doesn't really do anything because the plant actually requires nitrogen in order to take up calcium. And so um, for the most part, my soil is good. As long as there's a little bit of nitrogen added to my soil, my tomatoes will not have blossom end rot. And so that I know that it's not a lack of calcium, it's actually a lack of nitrogen that is a problem. If you know that your soil has plenty of nitrogen, but you're still getting blossom end rot, it may be a lack of calcium, in which case there are supplements you can apply that have calcium in them. Um, or it might just be um, uh, watering that is really inconsistent. So if it goes from very wet to very dry to very wet, um, that can sometimes cause blossom end rot as well. So again, I, I generally don't encourage people to put or to start with lots of fertilizers and amendments. I just think it uh, overcomplicates things. Um, and especially if you're starting out, um, just start it simple. Diagnose problems as you find them instead of um, being so worried about accidents or having problems or making it perfect in the first place. Um, plants do not require perfection to grow. If they did, they would not exist. So yeah, just uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put another tomato. My um, determinate tomatoes are all going in the in-ground garden and they're going on these tomato ladders because they um, are going to take up a good wide square footage. Uh, so I'm going to leave my A-frames for my indeterminate types where they're going to be grown um, on a single string. Um, and the suckers are going to be pruned off. The determinate types, I'm not going to be pruning suckers, and so they can get quite bushy and quite heavy, and these tomato ladders are really nice and sturdy, and they'll hold them up. I like this speed drill because it helps um, break through the really compacted soil underneath the layer of manure that I've got in these beds uh, with, with relatively little effort on my part. And other than that, I pretty much put these in the same way I put the other ones in. It's not too complicated. Um, just make sure you get a nice watering in. Um, don't want them drying out right away. That'll cause them to suffer more. So indeterminate plants will set fruit pretty much all at once all over the plant um, over the course of a couple of weeks to a month, whereas determinate, uh, sorry, I got that backwards. Determinate plants will do that. Indeterminate plants um, are going to produce on the main stem branches first, and then it'll produce a long time later on the suckers. And so if you let the suckers grow and you live in a short season area, um, you don't tend to get crop off of them anyway, and they just take a lot of energy off of the plant, and they make the plant a bushy, um, monstrous nightmare to work with. So uh, I tend to try to prune all the suckers off of the indeterminates, and the determinates I leave um, to nature.
I'm just using a miracle Grow uh, granular fertilizer, incidentally. Um, this one is not organic. I'm not super fussed about it, to be honest. Um, I'm not very particular about whether it's synthetic or organic. Um, but if you are aiming for organic, you can find granular fertilizers that are organic. I think I've seen some from ProMix. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and train up my tomatoes here. I'm going to demonstrate one from this angle and then there'll be another angle coming shortly. And I'm just going to talk you through. Um, basically, I just cut the string to the correct length. I'm going to wrap it a couple times around the base of the stem. I generally do not tie knots because if you tie a loop that's even somewhat tight um, on the stem of the plant, that tomato stem is going to swell hugely over the course of the year. It's going to get quite a bit thicker. And if you make um, a loop that's too small there, it'll actually strangle your plant uh, and or possibly call, cause breakage. Um, so I tend to just wrap it and use the sort of um, friction of the cotton against the tomato's prickly stem to hold it up. And I just want to make sure that there's a little bit of ease in the string so that if the wind takes the plant, um, pulls the plant sideways, um, that the roots aren't immediately being tugged at. But you do want to have enough tension that the um, string is going to actually hold the plant up, that the string will be basically doing the heavy lifting of the weight of the fruit later on. So I generally wrap a couple of times around the base of the stem to get started, then I'll wrap the whole plant, and then I usually unwrap one of the wraps around the very base just so that I'm not strangling it. And then I leave, uh, I stop wrapping just under the last strong side branch because I don't want to break off the central growing, um, what I call the lead. If your lead does break out and you don't see a new lead um, or uh, you don't see a, a growing um, center stem that is continuing to, to grow taller, uh, don't worry. Just wait for the next sucker to appear and train that sucker as your new lead stem. Um, just again, make sure that there's only one or maybe two max. So because these are indeterminate tomatoes, they are going to fit quite well in here. I've got five of them on each of my trellises and my trellises are about eight feet wide. Um, so if these were the really bushy determinate types, they would probably, I could probably fit three in here, uh, comfortably, but because these are indeterminates, I mean, pruning the suckers out, I can fit five in the same space. So the pumpkin patch, I've actually got these cups. These are plastic, uh, disposable cups that I've cut the bottom off of. I use the bottoms all the time for collecting soil and for, um, using as uh, dipping for painting uh, for to wash my paintbrushes. Um, so I don't just throw stuff out, but I have used these cups for a number of years. They've actually held up quite well, but they only stay out for a couple weeks in the spring, so that's why. I put them in the soil. Um, this has been tilled, and the tilling is to help the soil to warm up faster. If we do not till, then the compacted soil takes about a week longer to actually come up to the correct temperature for the seeds. And so we've done a shallow till here just to get the soil warmed up for our seeds to go in. The um, walkways between the rows of pumpkins are going to be mulched with this wood mulch from the sawmill. Um, and this is what has been cut off of the wood that was harvested out of the forest fire area a couple years ago. So basically the outer scorched bark of the trees was um, removed and then the good wood inside was used for lumber and the stuff got turned into mulch which people could purchase. <clears throat> and uh, I actually found some morel mushrooms growing in it in a different location so that's quite exciting. But anyways these cups serve a couple of functions. 
Um, one, they serve as tomato, uh, as, as cutworm collars, sorry. Um, basically, cutworms creep along the so surface of the soil at night, uh, and they can't climb up the plastic sides of the cup very far. So this will keep the cutworms out of my new seedlings once I've got the seeds in and they start spreading. The other function that they serve is that this row does not have a soaker hose. And um, in order to get the water to stay in a single area in order to soak down, um, I can basically fill up the cups with water and the water is just going to slowly soak in through the center of the cup and creep down the sides of the cup where the cup has cut into the earth um, and will saturate the ground right there so that when my seeds go in, the soil will be nice and moist. The entire pumpkin patch is going to be um, covered, uh, well not the entire patch, but all of the transplants that you see on the wagon are going to be planted um, next to the soaker hose. The soaker hose has been on for a bit, so the soil is nice and moist, and you'll see that. Um, they're going to get transplanted, and they're immediately going to be put under a row cover. And the row cover just keeps them from shocking really bad with the uh, change in conditions. And um, without a row cover, I found that transplants of pumpkins tend to not be productive at all. I've tried it a number of years in a row and I've never really had success with transplants with the exception of last year when we covered them with a row cover. And the row cover basically ma makes sure that the temperature stays more constant over the plants and in the soil and in the water um, and so that the plants don't shock so hard and it also protects them from the scorching wind, uh, the scorching sun and the um, wind that can be quite harsh on them and as you can see it's blowing pretty good today as well and so the row covers just help to give them a gentler beginning so back to the morel mushrooms the type of morel mushroom that i found is called a black morel i think there's a couple of species within that sort of subclass um, but they tend to show up after forest fires. They like uh, alkaline soil with a moist environment. Um, and they seem to like wood ash. And so they also like growing under apple trees and apple trees I have. And so I've got a spot um, near an apple tree where we've actually put the mulch down already, um, which I've pulled back. I put a little bit of manure down. I put a little bit of wood ash down. And then I put the this mulch back over top, and I had soaked a morel mushroom in distilled water for 24 hours to hopefully um, try to capture all the spores in that liquid, and then applied it over the area. And hopefully, we can convince the mushrooms to grow there um, in the future as well. I don't know if that'll work or not, if I may have done something wrong. Sometimes nature is so simple and yet so complicated to reproduce. But uh, I did get a nice little harvest of morels for myself. I did make sure they were safe to eat. And I am looking forward to trying them. Alright guys, I think that's all I've got for you tonight. And so, happy planting, and we'll see ya.